Friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I want to welcome you to this online service of worship for September 26, 2021, for Riverside United Church, an affirming community of faith in London, Ontario. My name is Dave Exley. I'm the lead minister for Riverside. And I hope you feel a sense of God's presence lifting you up today as we offer words and songs of faith through this online service of worship. You'll see behind me, uh, hanging in our worship space this weekend, are quilting squares made by the members of our own Riverside Quilting Group. This is for a much larger project. It's bigger than just our community of faith. It connects with this week's a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation that takes place here in Canada on September 30th. Quilters from all over the country have been making blocks and uh, will be sending them or have, or have already sent them to a woman in Timmins, Ontario to be made into quilts for survivors of the residential school system. In our services this weekend, we will bless those quilting squares as we prepare to send them off, as we also prepare our hearts uh, to work for a better tomorrow. They may be, these quilting squares, only a symbol of our commitment to truth and reconciliation, but they are an important symbol. As we attempt to reckon with the sins of our nation's past and our church's past, our denominational past. As United Church of People, we must proclaim that we are called to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others. We admit that we're, we've not always done this, and so we join our hearts together as we attempt to work for a better tomorrow and to respond to the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission here in Canada. We're mindful that long before today, the space on which we gather, the sacred space we call Riverside, where I record this message, long before today, Aboriginal peoples were here tending to this land. In particular, we acknowledge that we gather here in this space on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Attawandaran, and Wendat peoples. The community, this community, and the surrounding area is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have this opportunity to worship on this land and work toward right relations with one another. May we, all as God's people, listen to the voice of truth and reconciliation that calls to us today and invites us to work toward a better tomorrow with all our relations.
Well, we conclude our sermon series for the month of September today, A Good Life, Wisdom for Living Well. Today, we'll focus on the theme, A Good Practice, as we consider the story of Job from the pages of the Hebrew Bible, a very popular story, one that is known to to many of us, but often a misinterpreted story from the pages of Scripture. Many thanks to Kyle Ganyu for reading this passage of Holy Scripture for us today. May we listen and hear the voice of God speaking to us today. A reading from Job, chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. A man in the land of Uz was named Job. That man was honest, a person of absolute integrity. He feared God and avoided evil. One day, the divine beings came to present themselves before the Lord. The adversary also came along to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to the adversary, Where have you come from? The adversary answered the Lord from wandering throughout the earth. The Lord said to the adversary, Have you thought about my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth, a man who is honest, who is of absolute integrity, who reveres God and avoids evil. He still holds on to his integrity, even though you incited me to ruin him for no reason. The adversary responded to the Lord, skin for skin. People will give up everything they have in exchange for their lives, but stretch out your hand and strike his bones and flesh, then he will definitely curse you to your face. The Lord answered the adversary, There he is, within your power, only preserve his life. The adversary departed from the Lord's presence and struck Job with severe sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Job took a piece of broken pottery to scratch himself and sat down on a mound of ashes. Job's wife said to him, Are you still clinging to your integrity? Curse God and die. Job said to her, You're talking like a foolish woman. We will receive good from God, but not also receive bad? In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. May the Spirit bless us with wisdom and wonder as we ponder the meanings of these words for our lives. And friends, let us pray. O creative God, source of all beauty, you give light to the soul. Open our hearts as we listen for your word and open our minds as we dream with you. Reveal your life-giving truth that comforts and disturbs us through Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, it might seem a little strange to include the story of Job in a sermon series entitled A Good Life. For on the surface, the life of Job appears to paint the picture of what we might describe as the dictionary definition of a miserable life, or at the very least, a not-so-good life. When compared to every other character in the Bible, it seems that Job has it the worst. Everything he has is destroyed in the story. His wealth, his beloved children, and his health. And to add insult to injury, it comes, all of this suffering comes as a result of God engaging in a high-stakes and somewhat narcissistic wager with someone named the Adversary. While we would all agree that that Job's life experiences are something we'd like to avoid, there is something, if we play close attention to the story, there is something about Job's life that offers us wisdom for our living. The story of Job might be one of the most misunderstood and misinterpreted narratives in all the Bible. At first glance, it appears like a simple story where the reader is asked to consider the question, why do good people suffer? However, as many biblical commentators will tell you, that's not the question being asked in the story of Job. As one commentator puts it, 
The question at the heart of Job is emphatically not, why do good people suffer? Everyone who lives in this world knows there is innocent suffering. The question is rather, given the world as we know it, in which there is innocent suffering, does God know and care? Is it possible to be faithful in such a world? Should one even attempt to be faithful? The first thing we need to understand is that the story of Job is a fictional story. That should be abundantly clear when we hear that Job is a righteous and blameless man. There is no one that can claim that to be as perfect as Job. The story is merely a, a parable, a story that can inspire our living and deepen our understanding of the world and of ourselves. The point is not for us to get caught up in Job's righteousness. The point is for us to consider how we might be inspired by his story as we attempt to navigate this world, a world where good people suffer and where we're called to shine God's light in the midst of this world of darkness. The parable of Job opens with a description of, of Job's life before things took a turn for the worse. He's an honest and faithful man, is Job. He's a wealthy man. He owns thousands of sheep, camels, and, and oxen, and has a vast number of servants. He's a family man with seven sons and three daughters. And he shows his love and care for his family as he attempts to bring offerings to the temple each and every day as a way of making amends for any sins that his children may have committed. The story then shifts from Job and his family to God, to Yahweh, and a character known as the adversary. To be clear, this isn't the devil or, or Satan, certainly not the one we see in popular culture. It's important for us to move past those images. They tend to limit our thinking when it comes to God and our faith tradition. But it is helpful to note that the original Hebrew word Satan is simply a generic noun meaning accuser or adversary. So the common English Bible translation, they get it right by translating it adversary. Well, God and the adversary, so the story goes, begin to have a conversation about Job's righteousness. The adversary suggests that Job is only a good man because he's not had anything of substance taken away from him. Stretch out your hand and, and strike all he has. He will certainly curse you to your face, the adversary says to God. And so, God agrees to allow the adversary to test Job. He proceeds to lose his property. Job loses his children and his health. Despite all that, Job does not curse God. Well, the adversary refuses to give up and continues to test him. Meanwhile, Job's friends come to him. They, they comfort him and console him, but they can't help but think that he must have done something to deserve all this. Eventually, Job curses the day that he was born. He shoulders the darkness and the pain of his life and his circumstances on his own. When God does speak to Job, the narrative begins to turn around. The friends who assumed he was to blame for his suffering are proven wrong. God is in fact not a God who is a reward and punishment kind of God. And the story ends with Job's wealth and his possessions being returned to him. The parable of Job is a, is a powerful story, but it's far from perfect. The God figure that is described in the narrative is deeply flawed. Thankfully, the main goal of this story is not to help us understand the nature of God. The goal of the story is to help us reflect on our imperfect world, a world where good people face darkness and despair, where good people face pain and loss. The book of Job reminds us that suffering doesn't come as a result of, of sin, mistakes we've made in this life. 
Suffering is just something that we have to face in our lifetimes from time to time, even the best of us. The question is, how will we respond to that suffering? Will we curse God? Will we respond to the darkness surrounding us by drawing others into a dark world of our own making? Will we choose to respond to our pain by bringing pain to others? Or will we make our way through the darkness into the light? Those who demonstrate what it means to, to live a good life are often the ones who, despite the pain and the darkness they've experienced in this life, choose to be light bearers, working with God to help co-create a better world. The way we practice this is we open our eyes to the darkness of this world, to the suffering that others experience, seeing the world as God sees it and longing to work for a better day. It's only then that we can begin to do the work of bringing healing and wholeness to the world. Far too often, our limited vision prevents us from seeing beyond our day-to-day -day frustrations. We pound the steering wheel after we hit the tenth red light in a row on our way to a, an appointment. We cry out in frustration, assuming that, that God or the universe is working against us. When we fail to get the job or we get a poor mark on the exam, we assume that God is cursing us. Our favorite, favorite team loses in the first round of the playoffs again and again and again. And we conclude that the world is an awful place and somehow God's working against us. When placed side by side with the experiences of Job and perhaps more importantly, the real life stories of people we know, whose stories are known to us, our day-to-day -day frustrations can often seem petty and insignificant. The truth is, God doesn't choose our reality. Working alone to either bless us or, or curse us at any given moment in our lives. No, God instead invites us to co-create with God and with one another. Co-creating with God comes down to good practices. And one of those good and godly practices involves us responding to the darkness of this world with light. Like Job, we can let the darkness wash over us and remain faithful to the light that is planted deep within us, that still has a flame there lit for us. We can choose to speak those godly words of creation, let there be light in the midst of the darkness we face. For just like Job, that is the one and only thing we can control. One way to respond when we see or experience the darkness of our world is, is to curse God. And another way is to say, how can I bring light to the pain that I'm experiencing, the pain that I'm seeing? What can I do with this gift of life that I've been given? Just a few years ago in late 2015, Canadian artist and frontman for the Tragically Hip Gord Downey was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer just three days after attending his father's funeral. Given the circumstances, I'm sure there were people around Gord, whether they said it to him or not, that might have thought that he had turned into a modern-day Job at this dark moment near the end of his life. But rather than curse the day he was born or, or raise a fist or, or something else to the heavens, Downey used his remaining days to shine a light into one of the dark places in our world. His final project was a collaboration between him and comic book writer and artist Jeff Lemire from Essex County, not far from here. Together they created an album and a corresponding graphic novel as they shared the story of Chani Wenjack with the world. Chani's story is a, a tragic one. He was one of the many young children that lost their lives as a result of residential schools here in Canada. In an attempt to 
return home after being forcefully taken from, from his home to a school in Ontario, some 400 miles from his home, the young Anishinaabe boy died of hunger and exposure to the cold while trying to get back home. Gord Downey could have done anything with the past few years of his life. He could have tuned out the world. He could have completed a long bucket list of things that he selfishly wanted to do before his untimely death. He could have kept playing the same songs he wrote at a happier time in his life, making more money and being indifferent to the world's problems. And perhaps more relevantly, when we consider the story that we heard from the scripture this morning, Downey could have cursed God and spent his final days angry and bitter at the world. But instead, he chose to speak light into the darkness. He chose to tell the story of a forgotten boy, a child discarded by the world. He did what fellow Canadian artist Bruce Coburn did when he saw injustice in the world. He picked up his microphone and invited us all to kick at the darkness till it bleeds daylight. Downey, like Job, they invite us through our living and, and through their example to adopt a good and very simple practice in our lives. They both invite us to use our one beautiful and fragile life to bring light to the world. Rather than curse the day or curse God, they directed their energy toward better things. We can do the same. In those moments when we find ourselves walking in the valley of the shadow of death, we can choose to be light bearers, using our energy to make this world more gracious and more loving. We can choose to bless God's name as we bless those around us. For as we bless one another, we bless God. And conversely, as we curse one another, we curse God. We only have the moments that we're given. We can use this moment to bless or we can use it to curse. A good life is one that chooses blessing over every other alternative. In the Secret Path novel, there is this powerful and rather agonizing moment in the middle of the book, or I guess towards the, the final third of the graphic novel, where the young Chani Wenjack is traveling along the railroad tracks, attempting to return home. He begins with a jar full of matches. Along the way, he uses them to light a fire each and every night, bringing much needed warmth in the cold northern Ontario climate. Night after night, he lights another fire until one day only one match remains. As the reader, you can't help but feel the weight of him striking that last match, knowing that his life hangs in the balance. I can't help but think that this image helps us as we think about what it means to be followers in the way of Christ. For we are called to do one thing with the one wild and precious life we have. We're called to be bearers of the light. With each word of blessing we share with the world, we can place another match into the empty containers of creation. We can ensure our lives are not void of meaning. With this moment we've been given, we can offer what life-giving materials we have for one another. Not because God is watching and will perhaps reward us when we do so or punish us when we do not. We can just simply choose to share the light, our matches with the world, because that is what we are created to do. Created in God's image, we are called to speak those same words that God speaks to creation at the beginning of time. Let there be light, light in the darkness, light for a better tomorrow. Let's go and be that light for all the world to see. Amen.
We pile up like dry bones, like orphans gathering in burden. We're broken, our defenses fracturing. So break our hearts again. Stretch us till we bend. Breathe new life. us new again our mountains are crumbling like sand into the sea our rivers run dry and let the rocks be Friends, as we conclude our service of worship today, I pray that you might do the work to be that one match that you can place in the container of others' lives. May we go out into the world, being the light of the world, speaking those words, let there be light to all creation. And friends, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of God's Spirit. Go in peace. Amen.